Welcome all. I'm Mark Morris, head of teaching. You are here today for part two of five conversations on architectural education. Yesterday, Paul Finch offered a snapshot of where the AA is today. He outlined its challenges and its strengths with gusto. Uh, today we look back to look forward. If this were a novel, by the time you get into chapter two, certain characters have been established, now we get into their backstories. And today, our archivist offers a complete history of the Architectural Association, abridged within about 25 minutes, and uh, lets you in on a world that we think we know, because we live here every day, but begins to tap wells that we have no idea about. And for those of you who weren't around in uh, 2010, when Ed last gave a, a lecture on the history of the AA, for the 20th Century Society, uh, that lecture online is a really beautiful thing uh, to, to spend an hour with. So I'd encourage you to check Ed's back catalog. At a time when a lot of universities, particularly in the States, are chucking out their slide libraries and closing their archives for lack of funding, the AA goes the opposite. And has a dedicated archive with a dedicated archivist who has made archival research and connecting the archive with design culture within this school one of the most exciting parts of our culture. It's a pleasure to introduce Ed Bottoms today, our archivist, who teaches in diploma courses in history and theory studies. He's the author of several essays, including The Marilyn Queen and the Royal Architectural Museum in light of a new documentary evidence published by the Journal of the History of Collections. Ed studied at Exeter University and holds an MA in Architectural History from the University of East Anglia. It's a pleasure to have Ed here with us as our only in-house uh, conversationalist, if you will, in the series. And uh, we're pleased to give Ed the podium for about half an hour to offer this abridged history. Then we'll open it up to the floor as we did yesterday for some conversation. Ed, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. I'm not sure I'm going to last half an hour. Um, really, working in the archives, um, really tend to get a little sense of the um, ebb and flow of subjects as they hit the uh, radar of postgraduate courses um, for history for faculties across the US and across Europe. Um, and as the subjects become fashionable and then move on again, and for the last few years, we've had ranks of scholars um, knocking on our door, queuing up to study the history of the AA in the 1970s and 1980s. Um, as you all know, this is the period when the chairman, Alvin Boyarsky, um, held autocratic sway over Bedford Square, pitching himself against the AA Council and inspiring unswerving loyalty, admiration and fear in equal measure, um, and transforming the AA into a major international centre um, for the avant-garde and experimental. So all this interest is totally understandable. The questions are good ones as to how a tiny school, tiny private school, averaging just around about 400 students, almost permanently on the edge of bankruptcy, stubbornly remaining outside the state university sector and administered on what you might charitably have called then um, an amiable, <laughs> a, uh, amiably amateurish basis how this kind of structure can produce a model of education, aspects of which have seen an almost global adoption in architecture schools, and how it could have produced a generation of architects, which include three Pritzker Prize winners, 11 Sterling Prize winners, and a whole host of RIBA gold medalists. How two rather badly converted Georgian houses, subdivided, partitioned and repartitioned on an ad hoc, hap haphazard basis into an ever-changing labyrinth of tiny, cramped spaces could ever prove to be a fertile environment for architectural education? These are interesting and important questions, but I'd like to take the chance today to pull back from the Alvin period, to pan back a, bit, a little bit, and to pull out a longer strand of the AA's history, one which stretches right back to its beginnings, one which for me is the most vital ingredient of the AA's makeup, and one which is going to be, over the next six months, as relevant as it has ever been. I'm, of course, talking about the tradition of student participation in the direction of the school. Now, one thing has always puzzled me 
is the sheer quantity of student publications produced over the last 130 years or so at the AA. And I did a little study of them a few years back and came to the conclusion that the AA, the AA had in fact published more journals easily than any other architecture school in the UK. And looking further afield, also in Europe and the US, I couldn't find anywhere else that had been quite as prolific. For me, this is a re very real indication of, that, of a student body that over a long period is empowered to think for itself, that takes itself seriously, and considers it has, by right, an intelligent questioning role to play and an important say in determining the path of its own, let's face it, very expensive education. So today, I want to look at some notable episodes in the AA's history where active student participation in the democratic nature of the school has been most significant, whilst occasionally trying to weed in some of these uh, more, more colourful of, of these student journals into the narrative. Okay, so, as I'm sure you know, the AA was set up in the late 1840s by a very young group of articled pupils, essentially as a protest against the abuses of the system of private articled pupillage. It was also, by implication, a protest against the RIBA, who was doing absolutely sod all about the problem. The young AA founders chose as a constitutional model that of a Victorian gentleman's club, with all members voting on an equal basis to elect a council and officers to run the organisation. And this, of course, remains to a certain extent um, the same today. Crucially, in these early decades, the AA functioned perhaps as the only platform to, for debate, discussion and campaigning available to what was a young, voiceless and unrepresented part of the section um, of the profession. So it's not only set up by students, for students, but it was bolshie protesting students at that. Now, I haven't really got time to go through in any great length the sometimes, um, sometimes rather obscure satirical prints and publications to come out of the AA in the 19th century, or indeed to look properly at the Tufton Street Tatler, um, a journal born out of new divisions within the AA caused by the formation of a day school in 1901. Tensions which set members by now an older generation, and then sometimes, in some cases, the actual founding fathers of the AA, against the newly signed up young students of the school who considered themselves to be the true inheritors of the original AA spirit. And if you ever go to a general meeting of AA members today, you may very, very well get to see echoes of this, uh, this uh, tension in, in, uh, in place. Um, and the illustration on the right um, is something of a protest against the RIBA exam uh, course um, being held at the AA, which some students regarded as a, something of a, a meat mincer, crushing individual thought, um, and spitting out object identical ARIBAs. You can see them crawling underneath the feet of the principal there. Incidentally, this was a point in the AA's history when it was housed in, a, in the Architectural Museum near Westminster Abbey. Um, which was a kind of bizarre cabinet of curiosities, a kind of scaled up Gothic version of the Soane Museum. Um, and the cartoon um, is a reference, go back to it, the cartoon is a reference to some of the ancient Egyptian objects to be found in the museum, um, including, believe it or not, a genuine Egyptian sarcophagus dating back to 1000 BC. Um, and this was also a time when the AA was advertising itself in its prospectus in the most humble manner as the leading architecture school not only in Europe but the most <coughs> preeminent one in the empire. Its graduates indeed were going on to occupy key positions all across the colonial network into the 1910s and 20s and its curriculum was directly copied into schools in as diverse locations as Bombay and Melbourne. However, I said I'm not going to talk about that, <laughs> instead I want to go on and look at a period in the late 1930s which is arguably the most revolutionary in the AA's history. Though much of the 30, it, throughout much of the 30s, disquiet amongst students about the AA's patently irrelevant Beaux-Arts curriculum had been steadily growing. And in 1935, a new principal, a guy called, um, named E.A.A. Rouse, was appointed, who brought in a raft of young left-wing tutors, and within the space of a year, had changed the entire academic structure. A unit system, teamwork, sociological research, and analytical inquiry combined with briefs for new towns and slum clearances 
displaced those are Eskis. Rigid opposition came from the AA Council and Rouse's superior as the Director of Education, H.S. Goodhart Rendell. A very vociferous group of communist students then staged a takeover of the AA Student Committee and demanded changes to go further. Um, and they published what can only be described as the first real manifesto, manifesto for a modernist education in Britain. Their report of student subcommittee on the school system, nicknamed the Yellow Book after the colour of its cover, was intended as, and I quote, the first tentative step to clarify the basis on which a modern school should rest. No official AA response to the Yellow Book was received, and matters came to a head in 1938 when Roe Rouse was sacked by the council, and then, who then added a fuel to the flames by replacing him with a Beaux Arts educated classicist, Fernand Villery. Against this backdrop, the government's Board of Education, which had been providing funding um, to the AA throughout the 1920s and 30s, was expressing disquiet over the fact that students could actually take part in school elections and to their horror, theoretically had an influence on the course of their own education. Under the threat of withdrawal, of withdrawal of funding, the AA Council proposed a sneaky move of recategorizing all students as probationary members without voting powers. This was put to the AA mem entire membership, who vastly outnumbered, of course, the small student mem membership. And the changes were made. This move, playing out alongside the increasing student desire for modernization, served really as a call for arms, emboldening AA students in their fight for their modernist ideals, but also against what they saw as an attack against the very democratic heritage of the AA. Consequently, in the summer of 1938, a new student journal was launched. Oh, this is the voting paper um, from 1939. Um, and the, this is focus. Perceiving themselves in terms of a communist cell, the editors produced a wonderfully slick piece of propaganda, opening the first issue with a grand coup, an essay contributed by Le Corbusier himself, entitled, If I Had to Teach You Architecture, exhorting students that architecture is organization. You are an organizer, not a drawing board stylist. Closely following this in the first issue was the real meat of the matter, a piece entitled, The Training of an Architect, an open letter to H.S. Goodhart Rendell, deconstructing a speech Rendell had made in 1937 on architectural education. The subtle but devastating logic of the argument worked a brilliant effect. Within months, Rendell had resigned with a nervous breakdown, and in truly dramatic fashion, at midnight during the end of term dance, it was announced that the modernist unit system had been saved. Subsequent issues of focus pressed home the advantage with an article by Mollinage on education at the Bauhaus in issue two. And when war interrupted publication, the editorial team had received a text from Walter Gropius for inclusion in a never to be printed issue five. And 20 years later, it was Richard Llewellyn Davis, one of the original focus students, who was to introduce the modernist system at the Bartlett, displacing Corfiato. Again, I have to skip over some very significant periods in AA history. I want to move on. Um, so I have to skip the golden generation of the early 1950s when the AA's young modernists, young modernists flooded the offices of the London County Council and were responsible for some of the seminal projects of post-war London, Churchill Gardens, Roehampton Estate, later on the Barbican, the Brunswick Centre, Alexandra Road. Names such as ABK, Howell, Killick, and Partridge and Amos, Generation of Neve Brown, who just won the RIBA gold medal, as you all know. Um, and this same short span of years saw future critics such as Joseph Rickford, Kenneth Frampton, Alan Colquhoun, and Denise Scott Brown pass through the school as students. This also was a period characterized again by student unrest. Richard Burton used to tell the story of arising, arriving as a fresh-faced new student in the AA and immediately being asked to sign a petition calling for the removal of the head of school. And this is a list of, um, I think, a list of the demands um, set out by the students um, in 19, 1951, I think it is, 52. From this period, another journal, PLAN, continued the work of Focus and promoted a left-wing 
attitude completely unthinkable in the mainstream architectural press. The first editorial um, making the case for the immediate reduction of spending on troops by £300 million in order to free men and capital for rebuilding fabric of post-war Britain. Incidentally, it's also of note for a remarkable essay on how to dodge the draft for the Korean War and is responsible for the distinction um, of being the only architectural journal in history um, to have a formal question posed in Parliament about it. Um, the question being as to whether the journal was actually treasonable. <coughs> but moving on, ever since the 1958 RIBA Oxford Conference on Architectural Education, the AA had been under increasing pressure to conform to the official system, a programme which called for the standardisation of education and the integration of architecture schools into universities. Correspondingly, negotiations were begun in the early 1960s by the AA Council regarding into the state entry into the state university system by means of a merger or incorporation um, with the University of London's Imperial College of Science and Technology. By the late 1960s, the heads of agreement had been signed by the AA and Imperial, and a competition launched for the design of the AA's new headquarters um, near the Arab Hall. But for the majority of students and many of the staff, a merger represented a betrayal of the autonomy and freedoms which had characterised the AA history. Whilst across campuses in Europe and the US in 1968, students were protesting for more freedom and rights, students at the AA were actually campaigning to prevent an erosion of their right to engage directly with their own education. And an extremely vocal student-led campaign to save the AA made increasingly strident demands. Some students engaging in guerrilla tactics, disrupting and intimidating internal Imperial College meetings. In February 1971, Imperial broke off negotiations, uh, citing concern at the nature and demands and intentions of the AA school community. They did not want to bring in a bunch of unruly left-wing troublemakers into their own student body. And uh, this is a great photo on the right here. You can see this is a mock funeral held um, for the death of the merger. And there's a, a coffin being <laughs> carried along. And there's some, some poor guy with a tuba who plays Chopin's funeral march throughout the entire, entire march. Um, and slightly earlier on the left, is a, there's a, a wonderful series of letters in the archive um, sent to the AA secretary when all the merger was announced. Um, and there were some of the most amazingly sarcastic or kind of um, savage letters sent by students, sent by members. Um, and this is one from 64, in fact. So this is a long process that rumbles on over a number of, number of years. So, when Imperial pull out, panic ensues at the AA, and Principal Michael Lloyd and the Council prepare for closure, calling a meeting of the school and telling students to look for an alternative place to study the following year as a school was to be wound up and closed. Instead, students and faculty took the lead, marshalling support and determination, support um, to keep the school open, formalising the concept of the school community and instigating a search committee for a new chairman. And to stage left, Alvin Boyarsky and a new era at the AA. Now all this is perhaps rather simplistic. Um, it's very sel selective and it's perhaps an over-heroic narrative but it clearly demonstrates at key points in its history, the AA student body stepping in to bring about change, to act as a force for renewal and revitalization, to allow the AA to reinvent itself to an extent not possible in other architecture schools. And it's not always just the big revolutionary ideologically driven moments, but the very fact that the director's contract contains a key clause that they must be constant, that they must retain the uh, confidence of the school community. In no other school must a director be so constantly aware or keep his or her finger on the pulse of student demands. In not too distant past, the student vote has been exercised more than once. But I think I might have painted a picture of the AA as a somewhat uh, constant hotbed of radical unrest, protest and anarchy. And I think if you look around you, you'll be aware that the reality is rather different. Um, there are very long periods when the AA school community can be said to be in almost total hibernation, um, when it seems any evidence um, of it being a participatory democracy has vanished completely, only for the voice of the school community to emerge at points of pressure 
or at critical moments, which really brings me to the context of the next few months when the AA school community would be asked to vote on a new director. At a point in the AA's history when it's trying to secure its independence through TIDA and is having to deal with a politically uncertain climate and with more external scrutiny than it's ever had to bear before. Um, and I have to admit that having attended some of the recent meetings of, uh, with students and the school community, um, a lack of attendance seems to suggest that the school community is still waking up. It's still slumbering, waking, waiting to be, uh, to be awake, awoken. Um, so I want to really finish off by kind of underlining the responsibility of the whole school community uh, to get involved in what is it, will be a hugely important decision in the AA's history to make sure that you can make intelligent decisions, you get you're in the position to make an informed voting decision. And I just want to end. Oops, see some more. <laughs> Alvin didn't have it all easy at all. <laughs> this is just a phenomenal bit of writing, this referendum news. <laughs> so. so what I really want to end on is a slide here that shows two very different directions the AA could have taken in 1971. On the right is Ken Frampton's modernist model put forward in his bid to be AA chairman. And on the left is Alvin Boyarsky's statement of intent. Your choice in February next year could have equal significance for the AA's future. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. I think probably like you, uh, I really kind of enjoyed that. Uh, but the problem is it raises the question, what is it to enjoy something? I mean, uh, I want to stick with the question of the archives, since that's what Ed is master of. But I also want, like, in a sense, to raise the question, which is this. Obviously, the AA enjoys having a rather sort of heroic myth. You know, not really of one foundation, but of several foundations in the past. And it seems to me that, that when you become aware of that, one of the questions you have to ask yourself is what role does that play in the AA? I'll come back to that in a second. I mean, I was put in mind of the remark by Brecht of pity the nation that needs heroes. Um, <laughs> having this kind of heroic past, sometimes, like in the last few years, especially when you see the sort of AA's walls, not covered with student drawings, but sort of photographic records of what you could only call its heritage. I mean, some of the internal design could have been done by the National Trust. Uh, and so, especially at this moment, when you're thinking about, you know, taking a, a thinking of a chairman, the, the question is not just to enjoy that heritage, but in a sense to be part of it. And one thing the heritage doesn't tell you is like how to be part of it. Let us come from you. I mean, in a sense, you know, even the heritage that, that we've heard described requires renewal. If you lapse, into saying, as some of you, some of us, are not above saying, well, what is the AA? Oh, it was very, you know, it's very famous for having Pritzker Prize, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the question is not how many winners we've had, but what we're doing to make sure there are some new ones. Um, and that responsibility lies entirely with you. Let's think about the archives, in a sense we've gone through uh, the sort of history of the mobilization around how the AA uh, 
should be organized, how it should be the democratic element, etc. I'm very much aware that the archives, in a sense, have a greater value than that. One of the things the archive shows is how students worked in the past. And in a sense, my recommendation this morning is one thing that repays some study is a study of how students worked in the past. First of all, what clearly comes out is they worked very hard. You will say you do, but it's, it remains a permanently open question. Um, last year, in the history and theory, we looked at the question of the clan, because there's a sense, I think, in, in the school, that the clan is kind of vanishing. People know less about the plan, they feel... Even if they do a plan, they don't, what I would call, think with the plan. I mean, you know, you used to think that an architect almost had a symptom. They could only think about the world with plans. The plan was how they chose to think. Now, that day has sort of somewhat passed, and it's a very muddled kind of analysis of how and why. Uh, someone, Manolis, came and gave a paper on how the most famous graduate of the AA, who is undoubtedly Michael Ventris, the great decipherer of Linear B, uh, who surely, and as it were, historically, will be the surviving genius, not a Pritzker Prize winner or anything, but someone who combined his architectural study with deciphering the major task, almost a major task in the humanities, scholarly one, to crack this language, which no one had. He did. The suggestion was he was able to do it partly, as against all the great philologists, around the world because he was an architect. Manolo showed that, you know, his work, for example, he was doing a competition for the TUC building just around the corner. And students were amazed at the work, the detail of the work with the plan. I'm not kind of advocating that, but I'm saying you need to know not only the history of the AA, but the history of the labor and intellectual life. It's not just who was in favor of modernism, who was against it, in a sense. It was, how did people work? And that is asked, not just as a historical question, but how do you judge how you're being taught at the moment? Obviously, that moment of the plan has passed. Perhaps the plan is vanishing. You say to someone in diploma, could I see you a, you know, a plan of that? They give you a cross-section of their rhino kind of stuff. Um, I don't call that a plan. Uh, I'm not here to, to kind of defend in any sense the plan. But I'm asking you also to attend to, in a sense, the detail, because the detail is the real substance of what you work on, how you work how likely this is to produce imagin imaginative, radical ideas. So, we have this kind of heroic heritage. <clears throat> but the question is not that we simply wear it with pride, though we do, but to use it as a sense of our responsibility to really renew that and to renew it in the only way we know, which is through work. Thank you. Ed, um, you started to outline through 
those names and those pivot points, those pressure points, um, where the AA has changed. You've also outlined this past of the AA being roughly a kind of chronology of an Ecole de Beaux-Arts model uh, turned over by Rouse and company, what we might loosely call a Bauhausler model, perhaps. Um, if Colin Rowe imagines architectural education by about 1954 ever only had the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and the Bauhaus as two worthwhile models of education, do we see coming out of the 50s in your history, in your sense of this place, a true third model? Does the AA constitute post-54 something that can stand next to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and despite its short life relative to the Ecole de Bauhaus, as something distinctive, or is it syncretic? Does it start to feather in those two and generate something unexpected? Mm. It's a good question. I mean, I think undoubtedly after the war, the AA takes on um, aspects of the Beaux Arts. Um, there's a practical training uh, unit built in the AA in the more, what's now Morwell Street, it was a bomb site, and they, they built a, a couple of Nissan huts and literally built a house every year, knocked it down, and, and started up again. And you would learn the trades. Um, and there's some great photos of people kind of roofing and uh, doing, you know, these public schoolboys kind of stuck up there and never done their day's manual work in their life. Um, but the, I'd say it's very, it's very particular to, I think, first of all, to England or to the UK um, and to the AA. It's, it's a kind of more of a compromise. It takes a little bit of out of everything. So there are continuances from the, from the Beaux-Arts still in there. There's, um, there are, it becomes more international. Um, for me, the kind of, the real change happens in the 60s, really. Um, and there's one interesting period under um, a guy called John Lloyd, um, later Michael Lloyd, who is deeply unfashionable to kind of talk about, but he was, and he was kind of a divisive figure at the AA in the late 60s. But he had some very interesting ideas and they introduced the kind of what became later the unit system under Alvin. Um, and basically students were given the chance to, at one stage, to choose what, not, what, not a unit to go in, but to choose what subject they wanted to do, what topic, and then they would find a tutor. So they wouldn't kind of follow a prescribed curriculum throughout the year or throughout several years. They would actually go and follow their own interests. Um, and he was a great believer, I forget, the, the, um, there's a philosophy of, of uh, school education that was quite radical at the time that thought that children should be allowed to learn when they wanted to learn, what, when they wanted to learn, what they wanted to learn, um, so there'd be no kind of rigid kind of classroom period, etc. And so he tries to implement this a little bit into the school, um, and arguably this kind of descends into chaos um, and, you know, at, toward, towards the end of the 60s. But for me, it, it really turned, it's a quite, an, 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 quite a unique situation in the AA at the time. And I'm sure, you know, the 70s, what Alvin does, it you know, couldn't have been possible without that. Um, yeah. I asked the question in part to go to this way of working that Mark outlines, that the, the sea change you see in the archive between these two phases is mm -hmm. like nothing else. And maybe now we're experiencing that again. Uh, to open it up to the floor and the time we have remaining, uh, this. This particular conversation was originally entitled Everything You Wanted to Know About the Architectural Association, but we're afraid to ask. So I would say, don't be afraid. Ask. Yes. This, this question will be, I guess, a bit of a speculation but what it seems, again, from my very limited perspective of the subject about the history of the EA and how the student body would somehow shape the EA is before, even up until 70s, you can see the student body as a certain united organism which would define very, maybe unique, but very, you know, one directional almost uh, way of development. Whereas right now, the, we're living in a very pluralistic student body where besides, I don't know, certain everyday topics, I don't know, consumerism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, there is, it's, it seems almost impossible to produce uh, a student response, which could be considered like, you know, unified and universal in terms of how we select a new director. So 
how do you think we should react to this? Like, you know, how to make one decision based on an extremely pluralistic system? How this, like, you know, should be conducted? Well, um, I think embrace it. I just, I mean, I think you're right. The um, AA up to the well, up to really probably late 70s would would have been made up, you know. 80 to 90 percent of people from the same social background um, and from the same country, so it would have been a kind of monolithic uh, entity in a way, um, often with main the same similar social concerns um, or not. Um, and of course now it's so wonderfully diverse. But I think there are there are a lot of you know the world is shrinking and you know there are a lot of kind of things that unite you know people and it, I, d I don't see that as a problem really. I mean. I think the important thing is to get together and start talking and discussing these things. Um. I mean, I think in a way, I mean, the formal answer to your question is elect a pluralist. Um, but the reality is that the people we've elected tend to be what you might call de facto pluralists. I mean, if we think of after, I mean, Alvin wasn't, I think, concerned with like one school of architecture or one line, partly because as it were, he was absolutely committed to the practice of drawing in the school. And therefore, in a sense, you know, some of these questions were ulterior to him. Um, since then, I mean, there's a slightly, in retrospect, perhaps slightly kind of comic. Uh, Alan Balfour didn't have a hard line about architecture because he really couldn't make up his mind what he thought. Uh, Moison, in a sense, came in, but soon, I mean, realized, I think, even before he took up the job, the, the sort of architectural line he had, a sort of commitment to Dalibor Vesely's kind of phenomenology, you couldn't run a school on that basis. So in effect, you know, he was actually responsible for setting up the DRL, uh, appointing Brett, who wasn't himself, you know, a digital maniac. Uh, I mean, uh, so basically, you know, people actually tend to settle into realities which are themselves kind of plural. Uh, not so much out of conviction, but out of sort of de facto, you know, that's how it's going to be. Uh, so. I think what you say is a very important question. I mean, there have been times, once or twice, when you could see certain cancer-listed candidates kind of promote a, what appears to be a, you know, extraordinary totalitarian system of pedagogy and whatever, and the school doesn't put its vote where their mouth is. Um, so I think you trust the electorate. Um, people who are going to persecute you with their line tend to kind of say so from the beginning. So you can spot them quite early on. Another question from the floor just there. Um, hi. The, the previous question actually brought to mind something I was wondering about involving, like right now we do have a very diverse international student body, but has this always been the case or was there a, like a turning point? Because I'd imagine, I could see it either way. Earlier on you'd have a student body that may have been more British, but this was during the empire, so yeah, like I guess how does this tie also into dealing with a student body with so many potential interests because of their diverse backgrounds? 
So yeah, like, was there, I guess, a decided, like a decided point where the school became much more international? Yeah, um, basically it happens around about 1980. Um, in, between, from, uh, in the 70s, one of the things that comes out of the imperial crisis is that when the AA continues to go alone, um, the government decides to withdraw funding. Um, and we've got a lovely letter from uh, Maggie Thatcher as Secretary of State for Education, basically telling the AA to, uh, you know, we're not going to give us any more money. Um, so basically, grants which were given to students um, through the local authority um, become harder and harder to get. So Alvin has to go further and further abroad to advertise the school. And this kind of ties in with his ideology anyway of, of bringing together a kind of international kind of panoply of, of tutors um, and to encourage international students to come. But it, it's basically a necessity, um, financial necessity, that the, the AA has to get students from abroad. Um, and there's a, a period of maybe four or five years where it goes in the 70s from being, you know, 80% British um, to almost the total opposite. But that, that other part of the question, before the 80s, was the Commonwealth represented, or was it about exporting this model elsewhere in the Commonwealth? There was this connection between certain projects and research lines yeah. to Africa and elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, it's a very complicated question. Certainly there are big contacts with the Commonwealth. Um, grants are given to New Zealand and Australian students um, after the First World War. Um, there's a, the, um, the very few students coming from further afield. We get few from Japan as early as the 1890s. Um, we get some from China, very, very few. Um, it's really only the 50s when the Department of Tropical Architecture opens, um, which is a very interesting subject, and run by a guy called Otto Konigsberger. And you get a lot of students um, coming from the newly independent countries, coming over here to get an education in architecture, to go back to their own countries. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of post-colonial kind of point. And Konigsberger is an interesting figure who kind of is not interested in teaching them Western architecture, but is genuinely interested in um, teaching climatic design. And um, yeah, I mean, you look at all the figures in the 50s and 60s who are leading um, the architecture departments in a lot of these newly independent countries, more or less all of them come out of the AA's Department of Tropical Architecture. Yeah. I mean, in a sense, the demise of the group of tropical architecture, you know, it, it's worth making a comment that, in a sense, I think they were unfairly, like, squeezed out. I mean, actually, they had done work which was incredibly innovative at a kind of environmental and ecological level. Uh, they innovated enormously on keeping uh, architecture cool or warm without hardly any energy. In a sense, they were then kind of criticized in the school for being like a residue of kind of colonial service, uh, which I think was very far uh, from the truth. Um, and, you know, we should acknowledge there have been groups like that, you know, who've then vanished from the AA and one wants to make very certain that anything that goes in the future, really, we're quite sure that it do, does go. If we'd had that, we would have had actually a rather vital early ecological component to the school, which perhaps we lack. Uh, and again, that work can be seen. You know, it's like things like the University of Rotterdam. Uh, Could you tell, please, something about a visiting school? As uh, now it is a very uh, broad program and, I guess, a big component in the school structure when it was established and how it affects the school development. Okay. Um, so, your best to ask Chris Pierce that one. It was when, when was it founded? Seven or eight years ago? 
visiting school? That's the, uh, um, it's a fa fairly recent aspect of the AA. Um, I'm trying to think through any early precedents. Well, other than what we were just discussing. Yeah, not, not, not so much. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, it's a, a very weak answer, but yeah, I'd say six, seven years ago. A question just back there and then Frederick. Um, yesterday we talked about what makes AA unique and the unit system was mentioned. So my question is, has the unit system ever been up to debate? And was it relevant? And did something come out, for, out of it? Or should it be put up to debate? Yeah, I think I think it's it's always been up for debate um, in various at various levels, um, and yeah, I mean I think it's you 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 know when you're looking at um, a changing architectural education scene and changing context and you know you've got to look at everything and uh, for, just on a personal level, I'm sure there's room for change and this should be things that you're discussing and things that should be should be being looked at. I, I think, I mean, the first point is when you discuss the AA and the uniqueness, the one thing it's not unique for is the unit system. I mean, the unit system may have been developed in its contemporary form at the AA, but it soon spread across the world. Um, and, you know, that ought to alert people, you know, if everyone's doing this, perhaps we should have another thing. Um, I mean, you know, it's not normally the test of a good idea that everyone starts doing it. Uh, I think, as it says, there have been, you know, at one level, it's subject to a sort of low-level uh, critique. You know, people certainly have criticisms of it especially if you were here two weeks ago, I mean, uh, when people tried to get into their units. Um, I think very few people have ever proposed something like an alternative. But even if it wasn't an alternative, I mean, I don't think we've had a discussion which says, well, it has the following strengths and it has the following weaknesses. They're not really too difficult to think out. Sometimes what students experience as the strengths of it might actually from the outside look like weaknesses. You know, the, is the cohesive, strong character of the group, which everyone testifies to, is that in the end like a good thing? Uh, or subject to some criticism? So I think, you know, of course, with a election of a director, it's, I don't imagine, I may be wrong, but I don't imagine it's suddenly going to be up for discussion and then goes. Um, but there are possible proposals to modify it. Of course, it's modified already by having like the complementary studies as part of a set timetable of educational programs. Uh, there were once unit teachers who frankly were totally opposed to their being complementary studies. They thought that the unit should teach the students everything that the teacher knows about optics. It had a very vivid representation here in the figure of the architect, Peter Salter. If, as you had to do, stay in his unit for two years, um, you'd know everything that Peter Salter knew about architecture. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, but you, he, you know, you certainly have seen him a few times. So, you know, people, it's not beyond the wit of the AA to be able to modify the unit, depending on what you think the problem is. 
I don't think it's a good institutional thing to say, you know, we've got the unit system, let's talk about that and how we can improve it, because, you know, it entirely depends upon an argument what you think the problem is. Uh, but as, as Ed said, it, it goes on continuously being discussed. Uh, last question, Fred, you had your hand up early on. From the perspective of having been a student and now teaching, and in response to the first question, which, I, by the way, think is a large part of it is a perception issue, that when we see history condensed in this way, it always looks prettier than it, what it was. And we idealize these people marching in the street that happened once in decades, perhaps. So I think that's, that's worth to take into account and maybe partially not be too hard on ourselves. But from this perspective that I mentioned, I was interested to hear your thoughts on the relationship between teaching staff and students within the student community. And if you've seen patterns in activities happening in the past where tutors have been more engaged or less engaged. Because one might say, partially a bit controversially, that a lot of the success of the AA has been to the rapid circulation of tutors. Mm -hmm. And big generalization, but you often see new tutors sitting in the front rows of these sort of events uh, and engaging. Yeah. And so I was wondering if reflecting on what the AE looks like today and what it perhaps looked like in one of these previous occasions where we saw a large amount of activity. Mm. I don't know about kind of identifying trends or kind of uh, patterns, but um, just kind of anecdotally, um, interviewing people who've been to the AA in the 40s, 50s, 60s, kind of the most constant kind of remark that comes up is, you know, ask them, you know, who is your tutor, you know, what was the best kind of, you know, what was the best um, teaching that you came across? And they said, well, tutors didn't really teach us anything. We just taught, us, taught ourselves. And in a way, I mean, I think it's the environment. It's the, the kind of being pulled, pushed into this kind of um, environment of like-minded, kind of competitive individuals. And, and the tutors there, you know, to help kind of foster that. Now, they're interesting. In the 70s, there's, um, I know there's a period where a group of tutors actually decided to do their own, well, to do each other's briefs. So they would not only, you know, do the teaching, but they would actually submit their own work amongst their student, that of other unit students, um, which I thought was a lovely idea and, you know, really get them to commit and to kind of communicate between units. Um, so something along that line to, to, to engage um, with the students is, is, for me, the value. Um, that's, that's probably really all I can kind of say, I think. But. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I think on the last point, I, I think that would be great. Uh, not least because one has a slightly malicious wish that now when higher education is sort of close to intellectual collapse, uh, you know, teachers in all universities ought to have to take an annual exam. <laughs> and it was such a pleasure. Um, <laughs> But you say about the demonstration, I mean, I was thinking when looking at the, uh, the slide, I suppose, especially in respect to the cohort of students now, one of the great things about a demonstration, strangely enough, is it's an opportunity for the students to see architecture. It's very <laughs> difficult to get them out of the building to go and look at stuff and like a demonstration. I mean, it's like you begin to imagine that you know, a possible conversation at the AA is you say to the student, why don't you get out and go and look at the buildings and just walk around the city? And the student says, no, I can't. I've got to be in the library here writing my essay on the flaneur. <laughs>